At the time of recording, the Libyan Red Crescent confirmed the death toll in the country as having crossed the 11,000 mark, with at least one report saying it has reached up to 20,000. How has the so-called international community contributed to the magnitude of the latest tra tragedy being faced by the Libyan people? Texas and eight other states in the United States are suing the federal government to repeal a program granting some relief from deportation to thousands of undocumented migrants who arrived in the country as minors. What is the impact of the latest ruling by a federal judge in Texas on the lives of these unprotected migrants? And in about a month from now, New Zealanders will head to the polls to elect a new government. Can we expect the trend of coalition governments to continue as it has for the past decade or so? Uh, Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you as it always does from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. Before we go any further, this is an invitation to like and subscribe to the show and the YouTube channel. First up, the Secretary General of the Libyan Chapter of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies has confirmed that the death toll resulting from the dam burst after Storm Daniel hit the country has risen above the 11,000 mark. The mayor of the eastern city of Derna, uh, where the impact has been the most devastating, said the number could cross 20,000 given the number of neighborhoods wiped out by the 30 million cubic meters of water that have flooded the town. Fingers are being pointed at the lack of governance in Libya and how the conflict has impacted the upkeep of critical infrastructure. But much of Western media is studiously avoiding the role of, international, of uh, the international intervention in Libya and what has brought us up to this point. Abdul is on the show today to address that critical question. Abdul, if I can ask you first about the absolutely horrifying, obviously, humanitarian situation over 11,000 people uh, reported killed uh, after these two dams have burst. Uh, what are the reports you're getting, if any, and what are the complications in uh, humanitarian aid efforts in the country at the moment? Well, the actual figures may go even uh, higher. If you see some of the estimates say that the, the, uh, the number of people who are killed is estimated, uh, estimated to be around 20,000 and more. Because uh, nobody knows for sure, uh, because uh, the overall uh, system of governance in Libya is not um, up to the mark where it is exactly uh, recorded how many people were living in the area, how many people are missing. So the reports keep on coming. Initially, in the first few days, there were reports that even the government claimed that around 2,000 to 5,000 people are missing or, or feared dead. But as the days progress, what we see every day, the numbers are increasing in, in a huge number. A huge uh, number. So that is uh, one. The second thing is uh, the 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 if you see the construction uh, which uh, uh, Derna and other uh, the eastern uh, Libyan cities uh, are, yeah. uh, most of uh, the these localities are where kind of when you. You notice the structures were built with mud walls, or the the, uh, the structures were not strong enough to hold the kind of force the water released when yeah. uh, the water level uh, uh, rose primarily because of the bursting of the two dams, and that has led to uh, the destruction in the in the city, uh, uh, not only near the coastal region but also to other uh, smaller cities. So Derna is not the only uh, city which is affected. Mm -hmm. There are other smaller cities in the, in, in the area which are also affected. And thousands of these people have been basically uh, swept by the water into the sea when, while they were sleeping. So that is one. The second thing is that the number of displaced yeah. that is really high, around 30,000 people. And uh, we, we are talking about... Uh, these big uh, numbers, when you should consider that Libya is not a very big country, the overall population is not big. big. So these numbers in proportion to the population are quite high. Mm. So uh, uh, around 30,000 and more people are displaced, 20,000 are feared dead, and nobody exactly knows how many of them more, uh, more, more bodies will be dis 
discover in the future in in the near future so yeah that is the overall situation and as term, as far as the aid is concerned um, as i said before the libyan government the governments are not in a position to do uh, uh, the, kind, the amount of relief and rescue rescuer required and therefore they are hugely dependent on the international aid and international uh, support so regional countries of course are pitching in turkey is there egypt is there other uh, algeria is there and uh, some of the arab countries are also participating in it uh, from the west asia but uh, libya needs more uh, international efforts to uh, help the humanitarian situation on the ground deal with this immediate uh, in in general abdul also if we look at you know there are conversations happening in sections of the press uh, regarding the upkeep of this kind of critical infrastructure and and in in the issues uh, in libya with maintaining uh, you know such mega projects uh the intervention uh, us led nato intervention in libya uh, has also played an important part in bringing us to the situation today if you could give us a bit of context uh, regarding that aspect because it's largely being ignored in the mainstream press uh, as to what has brought us to this point exactly see most of the international press is talking about the quote and quote corruption uh, in the libyan government their urge, their uh, susceptibility to fight war and so, on and so forth completely ignoring the fact that libya what is today is uh, primarily because of what happened in 2011 the nato led invasion the the arrogant uh, uh, attempts by the us and its allies to basically uh, Uh, remove gaddafi from power led to a situation where the factions in the uh, libya started fighting uh, among each other uh, with each other and that the the war has not be, there, is, there is no attempt made serious attempt made to kind of resolve the conflict in libya which was created by the international in, intervention so um, if you see uh, and in fact they were aided uh, all these war warring factions have been provided aid and uh, other kind of support to basically continue fighting uh, so that is one reason that libya which was once a very uh, in terms of uh, maintaining infrastructure in terms of overall economic performance in terms of having a very responsive state system was a functioning state and one of the best performing states in terms in in Af- africa at in least. the region yeah yeah so wha- what happened that led to this state where the uh, a, a rich country by the way which has uh, enough resources to maintain the 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 small population it has uh, in a very favorable uh, uh, population ratio it has despite yeah. that it is not able to do it primarily because there are two governments in libya and and libya has been fighting the libyans have been fighting against each other ever since the the international players have started intervening into it so the war in libya which has created this pressure on the government and the overall governance has failed because yeah. the focus is not on governance but on war and other uh, aspects uh, is primarily because the international invent- intervention which was done by them and therefore this putting blame on the libyans is basically it shows the hypocrisy with which the usually the international players try to wash away their hands whenever there is something at this level happens and bl- blames the victims not trying to not yeah. even trying to acknowledge their role in creating this particular mess so if libya had a functioning government the 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 kind of destruction we are seeing there on the ground would not have been uh, uh, as at least as at least it could have been avoidable to some exactly. to a large extent all right all right abdul uh, we we leave it there for today thanks very much for that update and and of course we'll have you back on uh, as, uh, for more updates of course as news comes in and as this crisis uh, unfolds next up federal judge andrew hanen a Republican political appointee in Texas uh, on Wednesday the 13th of September ruled that the deferred action for childhood arrivals program a federal government policy that prevents the deportation of undocumented immigrants who entered the United States as minors is illegal 
the group is popularly referred to as dreamers and supporters of the program argue that it protects the rights of those who had no say in the matter when they entered the United States. The order does not require the federal government to take action against those who are currently registered or receiving protection under the program, but it does prevent the government from registering any new applications. Texas and eight other states are suing the government to repeal the program. Anish is with us for details. Anish, good to have you back on the show. Uh, the first of two stories we're talking about is, uh, I suppose, a fresh attack on uh, the rights or, or at least regulations around uh, immigrants in the United States. Uh, tell us what exactly the judge has ruled and how this impacts uh, thousands of children who are seeking some kind of protection and relief from deportation uh, and other such punitive sort of efforts by the uh, American state? Yes, so uh, the judge has ruled that basically uh, the executive, as, as in the president, does not have the powers to uh, create uh, what are effectively legislations, uh, uh, you know, bypassing the Congress. So it basically ruled that the continued uh, uh, renewal of the DSCA uh, goes against the sort of, uh, you know, very, a very nebulous concept of the separation of powers of the state. Uh, as well as we talk about, uh, you know, the separation of powers being in the United States, which would seem very clear cut in many cases, including in cases like this, uh, it's not very clear how, uh, you know, how the legal nitty gritties work, because we are talking about a 250 year old constitution that has barely been changed in many ways. That aside, uh, this ruling itself comes from a very politically motivated uh, judgment uh, because A, obviously it hinges on this whole uh, nebulous concept of you know, separation of powers because, but the executive could, uh, might as well ar argue the fact that they did not really legislate, they just continued an existing program, mm. uh, which the judgment then goes around to say that it also goes against certain my immigration laws in the country at the moment. So whether or not uh, certain regulations or certain uh, protections can be afforded by the executive is something that has been, uh, you know, completely thrown out of the window. There is no question, like there is no uh, question being asked on that front. Uh, so it's like on a judicial or a legal, uh, you know, perspective, it's not very, uh, it's, it's still a very uh, contested, uh, still based on very contested crops. On the other hand, uh, you have, you know, issues going to come around for about 560, 570 thousand or so enrollees, uh, many of whom are going to be in limbo, although most of them might be still considered for the program because the court allows for uh, the program to continue to be uh, rolled out for people who uh, applied before July 20. One, which was when the per court first ruled it as illegal. So it is something uh, we need to see how many of them will be still affected. Many of them may not be children, but they did come to the United States as minors, and they definitely requires. Many of them are very young adults, and many of them are, uh, you know, maybe even unaccompanied minors. So they still require a certain level of assistance to continue in the United States, or they face deportation at the current juncture. Uh, Anish, you uh, alluded to the kind of political environment surrounding uh, this judgment. Uh, give, give us a bit more uh, on that front. Uh, this is, of course, a judge that was appointed uh, by the Republican administration under Donald Trump, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and uh, we are sort of in very much in the middle of an election cycle in the United States. Uh, so, leading up to 2024, can this be looked at as part of the Republican agenda, the Republican push uh, to regain the presidency? I mean, very definitely so, because at this current point, uh, the Republicans, especially uh, the Southern Republicans, have definitely doubled down on uh, their anti-immigration, uh, anti-foreigners uh, 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 kind of stand that they have pretty much peddled during the Trump era and even before that, actually. Uh, so this, uh, obviously, the, uh, the case was even initiated by Republicans, to begin with Republican state administrations, uh, many of them who claim uh, to have been suffering, quote, quote, 
uh, from uh, you know the sort of uh, undocumented presence of undocumented immigrants, even though there is uh, you know many of their claims are not with uh, any kind of substantial evidence. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, and it becomes a big problem because a uh, large part of the problem is the fact that the Democrats have very often missed the window when it comes to actually. Uh, you know, institutionalizing several of these, uh, you know, very vaguely created uh, protections, Programs. and this includes the DACA, and that uh, is something that the Democrats have to also answer for. Uh, the fact that they, it is not that they never had any kind of triple majority, uh, and uh, including the state, uh, including holding the presidency before, mm. but that it's just that they have always found excuses to actually do anything that will be substantial and would actually uh, you know uh, prevent them from appeasing some of the right wing uh, talking points at some level in fact and that is something that we see currently as well we do not see that level of commitment from the democrats and so obviously the republicans are taking a significant uh, you know benefit from such uh, such uh, uh, uncertainty from the opposing camp all right, Anish, thanks very much for that update and we'll be back with you in just a minute to talk about uh, the upcoming elections in New Zealand. As I was just saying, in a month from now, New Zealand will elect a new government and give an opinion polls at this early stage, as well as a strong anti-incumbency sentiment in the country. It's likely that neither of the two major political parties, uh, that's of course Labour and the Conservatives, will gain a majority. Anish is still with us, uh, so let's go over to him for a quick rundown on the political scenario in New Zealand. Uh, Anish, for those of us who are perhaps unfamiliar with uh, the workings of uh, New Zealand governance and electoral politics, uh, if you can, as broadly as possible, give us an overview of the situation in the country and, and what do we expect from the upcoming elections? Yeah, so it is going to be very interesting for New Zealand because uh, a, they are always uh, they've always had to uh, essentially boil down to a coalition government for the past uh, decade, more than a decade actually, ever since they established the current uh, proportional voting system, which gives basically more or less equivalent. I do not want to get into the details of it, but it basically gives more or less the equivalent uh, seats that uh, parties have gained from their votes and based on their vote share, and that is pretty much how things work in many ways. And this is going to be a very close election. Uh, we are already seeing the Labour being quite behind uh, the the National Party, which is the conservative and right wing uh, group, the opposition, which leads the opposition right now, and have all, also founded, uh, you know, had governments before, definitely, but uh, pretty much have taken advantage of a lot of failings of the current Labour government. Uh, primarily on its inability to uh, pretty much uh, bring down or contain the cost of living crisis. And on top of that, uh, the success of Labour government's uh, inability or failure actually to contain the the rent crisis uh, in uh, or the housing crisis in New Zealand, which, is all, which has been going on for nearly a decade right now. And these factors are definitely going to make a big dent in how uh, the labor is going to perform, but nevertheless, opinion polling, as uh, we are still a month away, opinion polls have been proved, proven wrong, and obviously uh, the system as it was, the electoral system also gives up, throws up a, quite a bit of surprises. So we need to wait and see how that works out. Uh, we also need to be mindful of the current set of labor mobilizations that are happening in New Zealand, which is something that the labor is not dealing very well right now with. Uh, we, have, we have recently reported on uh, medical workers, we have reported on public service workers over the past several months this year alone, and multiple strike actions, industrial actions happening, uh, and that pretty much puts significant pressure on the current Labour government to address uh, a major part of their constituency to begin with, and also yeah. thousands and thousands of voters which make a big difference uh, in the final election electoral results. And we need to wait and see how Labour is going to uh, make this happen uh, in this current, uh, with just one month to go uh, in the current election fight. All right. Thanks very much, Anish. Uh, and we will, of course, be tracking that election in a month's time on Daily Debrief and, of course, elsewhere on People's Dispatch. Uh, we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for joining us.
That's all we have on this episode of Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do around the world. Uh, also, don't forget to subscribe or like or follow us on the social media platforms of your choice, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode of The Daily Debrief, same time, same place. Until then, thank you for watching. Stay safe. Goodbye.